Good morning. How are you guys? Good. Go ahead, stand up. We're going to get started with some songs. I'm Von Lewis, I'm the pastor for our contemporary service, and we are so glad that you're all here. Marty, next time we have to ask him, brother, you gotta come, it was so fun. And just getting to know people better, it was a great time. I'm, I'm definitely going back. As you remain standing, can you please join me for the call to worship, Psalm 34, verses one, two, and three. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. 
Amen.
Announcements. Our church picnic today is at 12 o'clock. It's all catered in. Barbecue and sides. You don't have to bring anything but yourself and there'll be games. So we hope that you'll be able to, to join us for that. And announcing a fall fun party Saturday, October the 1st from 2 to 4. Bring the whole family. We'll have games, prizes, craft, food, and a Halloween movie. Celebrate the start of the fall season and make plans now to join us. If you'd like to volunteer to help, Please see Christy Lowball or call the church office. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for your grace and for your mercy. Father, we're so thankful that you demonstrate your love towards us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ still was willing to die to save us from the proper penalty of sin. Father, I pray that today be the day of salvation for someone that's within the sound of my voice, that today would be the great miraculous day that they would surrender all and know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Father, we just thank you so much for your faithful, faithfulness to us. For us in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Excuse me. This morning I'll be preaching from 1 John chapter 5, verses 3, 4, and 5. Our faith in Jesus has overcome the world. Our faith in Jesus has overcome the world. Faith is being certain about the things hoped for that are not seen. God the Father and God the Son command Christians to love God the Father. And as I was thinking about that statement, that doesn't work in human relationships. You can't command successfully for another human being to love you. If you think about when you first met your, your wife, <clears throat> excuse me, and if you would have told her, I command you to love me, I promise you that had been the first and the last date you'd have had with her. Well, I don't know. I was so smooth, maybe I could have got away with it. <laughs> but love, as, as you've heard so often, 
It's an action word. It doesn't matter how many times you tell a person that you love them. You have to demonstrate it. And love is putting the needs of other people before yourself. And God demonstrated that in an incredible way. Well, he was willing to sacrifice his one and only son who was perfect, never, ever sinned. And from a human perspective, we can't even imagine that. Sacrificing one of our children to save people that we don't even know. And then a perfect child, too. And if they're perfect, they're going to be rich one day. And when I get old and need money, they'll be available to help me out. <laughs> That's the human side where we're selfish. But God truly demonstrated his tremendous love for us. And God has the right, the Lord Jesus has the right to command us to love our Heavenly Father. In verse 3 it reads, in fact, this is love for God. And the Greek word for that is, is agapao. And that's a love that's, that's a sacrificial love. Where you're willing to put the needs of someone else before your own. It's a faithful love. Where you can trust that person. You can trust them with your life. It's a love that's where you're devoted to another person. It's a love where you really value a person. And I don't care, men in the house, I don't care how many times we tell our wives, I love you so much. I value you so much. I will always be faithful to you. If you're disrespectful, word on the street is you were out with other women the night before, and the word gets back to her, you don't treat her right in front of the kids or family or friends. Will those words mean anything to her? She's going to be gone. <laughs> She's going to be gone. So love, it's an action word. And in verse 3, where it says, in fact, this is love and for God. And this word for God, and there's many different words in the Old Testament, in Hebrew, and the New Testament, that mean God. But in this particular instance, it's, it's the Greek word, Fails, where we get theology. And it's, it's, it means that, that the Father of Jesus, he is God, the true God. He's not an idol. And God is divine. He's, he's spirit. And this is, as human beings, this is just the part that I just can't wrap my head around it. That God is self-existent. That God is eternal, has no beginning and no end. As human beings, we just can't fathom that. Because we're, we're so finite. We have a set beginning and we, and we will all have a set ending date. And even if the rapture takes place, that's still a set date. So I know for me, I, just, I can't wrap my mind around that, that my heavenly father is self-existent and eternal, but by faith. By faith, I trust and believe in that. Jesus told the Pharisees this first and greatest commandment in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 and 38. And he said to, to the Pharisee, you shall love the Lord your God with, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And that means that you know, in everything that we do in life, where does it start from? It starts up here in our mind. And oftentimes it starts by what we see, whether it's good or bad. You see someone else do something good or bad, and you may say, man, forget that. I'm not doing that. I'm going out tonight. I'm not going to church. I'm not giving my money to that church. Or it could be you see other people doing that, and you say, wow, I want to be like that person. And I'll do that. So it's, you see it, then it's, it's in your mind. And then you'll decide if I want to live that way or not. 
And then your heart, oftentimes we hear a person say, I love you with all my heart. Now we know that the heart, it's an organ. But, when you're, but really when you're saying, I love somebody with all my heart, or I'm going to put all my heart into it, it's your emotions. God wants all of us. He deserves all of us. He deserves all of us. Moses told this same commandment in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, to the Israelites, that you were to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and your mind. And that seems like such a great commitment, or commitment, but if you think about it, it's not. When Jesus was willing to die on the cross to save us from the proper penalty of sin, and you all know I say this all the time because I love Rocky, greatest day in the history of my life. I can't even imagine where I would be. And I kind of can imagine it. I won't say any more because I don't want you to lose respect for me. <laughs> but wow, that day changed my life forever. And I hope it's made me a better father and a better grandfather, a better papa, a better, a better husband, a better friend. But, you know, we have to leave that, I have to leave that judgment, <clears throat> excuse me, to other people. You know, when, when they'll talk to athletes and, and people will ask in the interview how great you are. And if you're really good at something, you shouldn't even have to answer that question. And I would say, I'll leave that up to the people who watch me, or I'll leave that up to the people in the church who I've ministered to, to say if I'm a good man, or a good minister, or a good pastor, or a good preacher. We shouldn't have to promote ourselves, and hopefully that because we love the Lord our God with all our heart and our soul and our mind, our actions will be demonstrated how much we love God by how we treat people. When I was at St. Joe's, elementary school in Hamilton, and I probably was maybe fourth or fifth grade. And I, I read a book by the great Gail Sears, God Rest His Soul. God is first, my family and friends are second, I am third. And I was a little boy, that book changed my life. From that point forward, and I had great role models, especially from the women in, in my family, but that book really changed my thought about how to treat other people. And from that day forward, I always, I never forgot that book. And you just think about that. If you live your life that God is first, my family and friends are second, and I am third, you will live a tremendous life. And you're saying that I'm going to love the Lord, my God, with all my heart and my soul and my mind. Then my family and friends, I'm going to love them with all my heart and soul and mind. Then I worry about myself. And some people would think, well, well what about yourself? If you, if you put God first, family and friends second, then what about yourself? God will take care of you when you live your life that way. Other people will take care of you when you live your life that way. But it, it takes faith to live that kind of a life. To always put God first and other people first it takes tremendous faith to do that. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. And literally in the Greek, the word for burdensome means heavy or oppressive. And I bet many of you have had people tell you in your Christian walk, and especially maybe when you first got saved and maybe you used to go out and do certain things with people and they, and they asked you, you want to go out and do this with me? And you say, I don't do that anymore. Or they notice you talk differently. You don't drop F-bombs anymore. You bow your head and you pray before you eat. You don't drink anymore. You stop smoking. You don't hang out at the clubs on, on Saturday night and try to dance. 
<laughs> and you get up early and go to church, people notice those changes in you. And sometimes people will, will resent that. But God's commands, they're not heavy. They're not burdensome. If our heart is in the right place and we have that mindset that I love the Lord my God with all my heart and my soul and mind, then following God's commands, they're not difficult. I can remember when, when Laura and I first got saved. And we were some, well, I can't speak for Laura, but for me, I was a big heathen. <laughs> I was a, hadn't been to church ever the four years while I was in college. Maybe I can remember the Lori and I would go to the, the St. Joe's uh, in the inner city or the hood in Hamilton. The people would call St. Joe's Church the Catholic. And we would go. I'm surprised that the, that the, that the church and it was built in 18, I think, 47. I'm surprised when I walked into church it didn't fall down. And we would go to midnight mass. It was just, it was traditional. But outside of that, I did not go to church. And before that, I went to church every Sunday. And before every football game that we played. And sometimes even, I was in religion school as a, as a little boy in, cat, in the Catholic church. And went to church sometimes on Saturday. Went to college, forgot all about it, and didn't go. And when I got saved, it changed me. But it was still a little burdensome for me. We went to a Baptist church, and we would go to church on Sunday, and then they would have church in the, in the evening. And we never went. I was thinking, that was, for me, I was a new Christian. I was doing good. I only went to church four times in four years while I was in college, and now I was going every Sunday. To go to church on Sunday evening at that time in my spiritual walk, it was burdensome. <laughs> it was heavy for me. And y'all know I love sports. That's interfering with my NFL games and NBA. It was burdensome. <laughs> but a brother said to us, and I'm so glad he did, why don't you come to church on Sunday evenings? And initially I was thinking, I might, I, maybe, <laughs> depending on who's playing in the game tonight. <laughs> but I start, the Holy Spirit convicted me, convicted us. And we started going. And I started getting more involved in church. And we started having children. And it wasn't burdensome to take all six of our kids to different Sunday school classes and to teach Sunday school. It wasn't burdensome to be involved in the evangelism explosion and, and memorizing God's word and sharing the gospel with people. It wasn't burdensome any longer. As we walk with the Lord and we love the Lord our God, God with all our heart and our soul and mind, his commands no longer become burdensome. And then they no longer be, become a heavy load to pull. And I can remember when I got saved saying, I feel a huge weight that was lifted off of me. I was no longer carrying that burden of sin. And I'm so thankful that God is so faithful to us, even when we're not faithful to him. And you know, when you're following God's commands, they're not burdensome and they steer us in the right way. There are decisions that I made as, before I got saved that I would never even consider those now. I'm so thankful that when I was saved, the Holy Spirit came into me and I made better decisions and I was a, a better role model for others and for, for my children and now for my grandchildren. I'm just so thankful for God's commandments and how they've changed my life forever. And Christians have overcome the world, the present order of things. In verse four, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. And I'm just so thankful that when we make that decision to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, he considers us God the Father considers us as his children. We don't deserve that. But because of God's grace and his mercy, he sees us as his children. I'm so thankful for that, that when there's something going on in my life or 
your life or your children's lives or your family's lives that I can go before God, the throne of grace with confidence and lift you all up in prayer or pray for my family. Pray for those who are lost to get saved. I'm so thankful that God sees me as, wow, my hands are quick. I caught that still. I'm so thankful that God loves us so much that he sees us as his children when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Everyone who believes that Jesus is, is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. I'm so thankful that God sees us as his children. In verse 4, where it says, for everyone born of God, overcomes the world. And when it's talking about the world, it's talking about the present order, the present condition of things. Is it only me, or have y'all noticed, if you just think just in the last five years, have you noticed how much more the world has changed in just the last five years? Have you noticed how when you drive, especially on the freeway, how people are so much more aggressive God forbid if someone cuts you off and you turn over and look at them, you got to be careful. They, might, they may follow you home. And you, I, I'm a proud member of AARP. Those are my people. Those are my people. I love AARP. I'm not ashamed. You got to be, is it 55 to be a member of AARP? Oh, Kevin, don't worry about it, brother. <laughs> Those are my people. And I was reading it, and every time I get, I get their magazine, I read it, and then I quote it to Lori like it's the gospel. <laughs> Those are my people. And it was saying that this generation of teenagers deals with more depression and thoughts of suicide than any generation of teenagers in the history of this country. And I believe that. And I'm just, I'm not making, this is not a judgment statement at all, but I'm just stating the, what I had read in that article of AARP. It was saying also that one in five teenagers today believe that they're, and I always mess this up, is it LGBTQ, did I say that right? No. Yes, and I'm not, I'm not making a judgment statement, but that's the highest percentage of teens that are thinking that way. Why are so many teenagers depressed? Why are so many teenagers suicidal? You even hear about kids in elementary school, other kids bully them. And from being bullied so much, they commit suicide. I can't even imagine being like that. It kind of reminds me, when I think about it, like in Friday, when, when Craig was hiding a gun and Pops came in on him and was giving him a talk and he was saying to him, that's a dang shame. When I was growing up, we didn't use guns. You use these. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But you live. You live to fight another day. <laughs> and that's when we were a kid. That's how it was. You know, if someone messed with you, got into a fight with them, or if they are bigger than you and they beat you up, then if you had a big family, then, then your siblings would go back and take care of them. But the next day, we were playing again. And now, I mean, just why has the world changed so much? Satan. Satan knows his days on this earth of being in control of so many people are coming to an end, and Satan is so busy. I was reading, and once again, in, in ARP. <laughs> they need to give me a discount, boy, I'm giving them so much press today. They were saying that in this generation, we had the the smallest percentage of people who confess to be Christians. And I believe that. You think about when you drive to work, Monday through Friday, 
And then Saturday, some people might work, but they're out doing things. And then when you drive to church on Sunday morning, no traffic. You get here so quickly. Fewer people go to church. I had read an article, and this was not an ARP. And it was saying that this is the first time in, in the history of this country where you have households, where you have two generations of people in a household who have never belonged to a church. I can remember when I was a kid, and I didn't sell drugs, I didn't use drugs, but I grew up around a lot of bad dudes. People who sold drugs, used them. People who killed people. I grew up with just as, the guys who I grew up with, many of them. I can name just as many who went to prison, sold drugs, used drugs, or killed people than those that went to college. And I coached Little League Baseball, and many of the players that I coached sold drugs. I was, I was able to influence some, and, and, and hopefully people in the community were, but you know, some of them, one of the young men who I coached, and I just ran into him last, last week at, a, at a, little, a little pro football game, murdered somebody. But the world has changed so much. All those kids went to church, though. Their parents took them to church, and some of them went the wrong way, but they, they went to church. Now, it's totally different. Satan is in control of so many people. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Praise God that we have overcome the world. This satanic influence that's in the world because Jesus Christ died on the cross and saved us from the proper penalty of sin. But there are so many people that we know in our own families that don't know the Lord, aren't going to church, and to live by God's commands are burden, burdensome for them. But our faith in Jesus gives us victory that overcame the spiritual darkness of this world. Romans 6.23 saves us from the proper penalty of sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I think about the story when Jesus is, is talking about Lazarus and the rich man. And the Bible tells us how Lazarus passed away and went to heaven. He was in the bosom of Abraham. And that rich man said, have mercy on me. I am in agony in these flames. There are so many people in this world that we don't know for certain where they are spiritually. But they're not living their lives like they're saved. And there are so many people who are lost. The day they close their eyes and take that last breath, they'll be like that rich man that Jesus talked about. And ask for mercy. I am in agony in these flames. That's why it's just so important for us to reach the loss. And then lastly, in verse 5, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And in Romans 10, 9, it tells us, if, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. And I'm so thankful that the moment that we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, it saved us from spiritual darkness that we all are born into, that it saved us from eternal separation from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and saved us, as that rich man was saying, saved us from the flames of eternal agony. Praise God that our faith in Jesus has overcome the world. But there are so many people in our workplace, in our neighborhoods, and in our own families that have not overcome the world because they have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We need to be in prayer and be committed that they would be convicted of their sin by the Holy Spirit 
and know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that by our faith in Jesus that we have overcome the world. Father, we know that Satan is so busy. He blinds us. from the gospel. I thank you, Father, that you interceded on our behalf, Father, that the Holy Spirit convicted us. Father, that you ran us down. We are running away from you. And that we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, Father, and we overcame the world. We overcame Satan. We thank you so much for that. Heavenly Father, use us in a powerful way to reach the lost. And Father, I pray that we would live a life where you are first, our family and friends are second, or we are third. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray all these things. Amen. I am not skilled to understand what God has willed, what God has planned. I only know at his right hand Stands one who is my Savior I take him at his word and deed Christ died to save me, this I read And in my heart I find the need of him to be my savior Father, we're so thankful that our Lord and Savior Jesus was willing to leave his place on high. Father, we're just so thankful for your grace and your mercy. Father, I'm so thankful that you did not judge us according to our deeds. Father, I'm so thankful that you look beyond all of our faults. You look beyond all that we did wrong, all our sin. And you saw our needs, Father. You knew that we needed a Savior to save us from our sins. Father, I thank you 
for how faithful you are to me. Father, you're faithful to us even when we turn away from you and you're willing to forgive us if we only ask. We thank you so much. Father, I thank you so much that when Jesus died on the cross and saved us from our sins, Father, that we overcame the world. Father, I thank you that we're no longer in the grip of Satan, but we're in the hand of you and the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray as we go out of this place, use us in a powerful way to reach the lost. Father, use us to help others to overcome this world. And now may the love of God the Father and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And all God's children said, Amen. God bless you. God bless you.